everyone. I'm going to read from my phone because I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but thank you for joining us tonight as we, for the first time, come together as a nation to honor and remember the lives we've lost to COVID-19. I want to thank our incoming President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris for finally acknowledging the scope of loss and creating space today for families like mine. In doing so, they're shining a light on the fact that behind every single one of our 400,103 COVID fatalities is a person with a name and a story, a person who lived and loved. These are ju not just numbers. These are human beings and they will never again be relegated to statistics. Tonight, I want to tell you about one of these people, my father, Shafkat Rasul Khan. Shafkat Khan is not a statistic. He was many, many wonderful things. He was a loving father of three, the doting grandfather of seven, and the devoted husband to my mother for what would have been 50 years last October. He was also a community activist here in Jersey City who spent years carving out spaces and opportunities for others he conducted voter registration drives within the Pakistani American diaspora. We'll never have a voice in this country if we don't vote was a common refrain from him during these events. Ours was the apartment where people went for help. I can't tell you how often I'd walk in to find my father at the dining table with people I'd never seen before, helping them fill out voter registration forms, walking them through sample ballots, so that they'd know what to expect when they finally voted, or breaking down the options available for a family that was facing immigration issues. And post 9-11, my father worked hard to organize panels, bringing together Jersey City's many diverse communities so that we could talk beyond our differences and find common ground. My father was the truest example of a solid, reliable, and good human being who showed up for his family and his community every single day. Unfortunately, at the end, I couldn't show up for him. Not when he spent three days in a war zone of an ER, only three blocks away from us. Not when his heart stopped four days after that on April 14th. I couldn't even show up for him when he was buried. Instead, in perhaps what was the most surreal and heartbreaking experience of my life, I watched my father's burial live streamed on FaceTime. No one's father deserves this, and no family deserves the lack of closure, the feelings of guilt and anxiety, and the burden of COVID grief that my family has been struggling with over the past nine months. But sadly, my story is not unique. For every COVID death, there are an estimated nine close family members left behind. Our nation is experiencing a tsunami of grief. While grief is always difficult, grief during a pandemic is complicated. It's overwhelming, it's devastating, it's more than grief, it's trauma. In trying to navigate my own trauma, I've done something that I know for a fact would make my father proud. Four days after he died, I started COVID-19 loss support for family and friends, the first Facebook bereavement group for people dealing with COVID loss. Almost nine months later and almost 6,000 members later, I recognized that I've managed to create something beautiful from all of my pain. In a time when we're more divided than ever, when social media and our news cycle presents a landmine of triggers for my community, when it feels like the rest of the country has abandoned us, our group has become a safe space where people from all walks of life, religions, and political leanings can come together and carry one another in their grief. Because here's the thing, COVID is an equal opportunity killer and everyone is deserving of community and comfort. Becoming an advocate for the COVID loss community has given me the honor of amplifying the stories of many other Americans who have lost their lives in this pandemic. I've gotten to know so many beautiful departed souls during these past nine months, and I quickly want to tell you 
about two of them. These two, this is my father. These two men here, who are clearly just as handsome as my father, they are the fathers of respective, respectively my co-founder and admin, Angelina Proya, and our third admin, Brian Walter, both of whom are now my family. This is Richard Proya over here of Rochester, New York. He was a vivacious, loving, generous family man who approached every day as if it was an adventure. He was a baseball umpire, a fan of the Baltimore Orioles, and he baked a mean ziti. <laughs> Richard was on a ventilator for 10 days before he died alone on April 17th. Richard Proya is not a statistic. This is John Walter of Queens. John was a historian who loved everyone and everything good about life. Always had a red clown nose on hand to make others laugh and held the distinct honor of living at the same zip code for all of his life. John died alone on May 10th after being hospitalized for 19 days. John Walter is not a statistic. I want to thank everyone who's helped make this event possible. Mayor Stephen Fulop, big thanks to you and your team, in particular, Christine Goodman and Kimberly Wallace Galcioni. Councilman James Solomon, you've been so supportive of all my thoughts and ideas over the months about how to memorialize my community. Thank you for getting this ball rolling. Christina Libby, who is such a brilliant artist, you see her doing her beautiful work now. She has been so generous with her talent and time in these past several months. Thank you for being an ally for the COVID loss community. Christina Arquiza and the Mark by COVID team who have done the heavy lifting of taking our voices and our stories to Washington. And finally, Chris Kocher, who might be here somewhere, I hope, uh, of COVID Survivors for Change, who has worked so hard to provide COVID families so many opportunities to be constructive in our grief. You are truly the Jedi Master to my Padawan. We have a long way to go to truly honor and remember all of the lives that have been taken and changed forever by COVID. But tonight is a significant and important step in that effort. And I look forward to working with all of you to continue making this happen. Thank you again for being here and I hope you'll stay and listen to everyone else who's speaking today. And I would like to first welcome our mayor, Stephen Fulop, to speak. Thank you. I'll hand it over to you. I'm sorry? I'll bring you back up. Okay. 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 Sounds good. So, so first I, I, I wanna just say, Sibylla, thank you for organizing this. And uh, I was one of those people that reached out to your father and uh, asked for help and guidance like so many others. Um, my grandmother's name was Elizabeth Fulop, and she's not a statistic. She was 93 years old. She was living in a long care facility in Bergen County. She loved her great grandkids. She loved her grandchildren. She was an immigrant to this country that believed in this country. And she, like so many others, died alone, had a small funeral because she couldn't have all of her loved ones and friends there. And she's not a statistic. We've, stu we've struggled here in Jersey City, like the rest of the country. We've had 600 lives die and pass here from Jersey City residents, loved ones, neighborhood activists, council members, community leaders, organizers. You'd be hard pressed to find one person in Jersey City that doesn't know firsthand somebody that has passed away. Because while we are a large city, we're also a very small city that you know your neighbor and you love your neighbor. So today we stand here together with most of the city council and, and most of the residents here that have come out here today um, just to be optimistic that tomorrow we turn a page and maybe have a, some more resources. We think of the individuals here that are struggling. We reach out a little bit more to our neighbors, offer them a little bit more support and help where possible, and that hopefully the future is a little bit more brighter than what the past year has brought to all of us. So thank you, Sibylla, again for helping Jersey City stand with countless communities across the country today to memorialize all of those people that we lost. And uh, again, none of them are statistics. They are loved ones and family members. So thank you, Sibylla. Um, thank you. I think next on the list is uh, Vernon Richardson, who will speak on behalf of the family of our late Councilman Michael Yoon. Good evening, 
I used to be the chief of staff to the late Councilman Michael Yoon. Um, he too is not a statistic. I think at times that those of us who are left behind, we feel like statistics. My time with him is probably the most proudest time I have in my entire life. I, in real time, I would always tell everyone it was like, it was like living in an ABC network comedy. Picture it, a foreign born Korean American with a native born African American chief of staff. And every day, people would come through the door and we helped solve their problems. He is someone I miss dearly. He had no problem fighting for the policies that he supported, but he was a rare bird in this polarized time that we live in and that he was more than willing to hold hands with anyone the very next day after they ar he argued with them. <sighs> to any of the, you who have ever had a chance to have a conversation with him, you know why I love him so much. One single conversation with him, you'd walk away and say, I didn't understand a single word he said. <laughs> but you'd also know that he understood you. And that's why the people of the Heights loved him so much. I miss him so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vernon. Um, next up is Stefania Miklas McCall, who will be speaking to us about her dad, who she lost to COVID. Good, e good evening, everyone. And I wanna thank you for your time and thank you for listening to my father's story. This is my father, Stanley Miklas. On this evening of remembrance, I'd like to remember my father, Stanley Miklas, who passed of COVID. He was a frontliner working at a VA hospital in New York City. Early in the pandemic, when testing kits were scarce and not fitting the typical symptoms, my father was discharged from the Jersey City Medical Center in one of the fastest ER visits ever and was sent home to recover. And while he fought and believed, as we all did, that he was getting better, COVID took the strongest man I've ever known within a week's time. My father was a Marine and lived semper fidelis or always faithful in every aspect of his life. His life began in Germany during World War II when German soldiers took our family as slaves. My grandparents and my father came to America as refugees and made a home here in Jersey City. A graduate of Ferris High School, my father was drafted into the war. And while not happy about it, he, de he decided that if he was gonna go to war, he was gonna go with the best and enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. My father saw it as a chance to fight for the country that fought for us. He served two tours in Vietnam so that his mother didn't have to decide which son to call back home and was awarded a Purple Heart for the injuries he sustained during combat. He married my mother, Joan, before he left for war and she waited for him until he returned and together they had three children, myself being the youngest. I remember being a little girl and seeing so many veterans in the street and asking him, Daddy, how come you're not like them? He looked at me and said, because our family came from war. We understood it and they still loved me and they accepted me. And that love my father talked about, well, we were showered with it. <laughs> my father loved his family so much that we felt it not only in all of his sacrifices, but in all of the time he spent with us, supporting us, pushing us to achieve our best. We even felt it when he volunteered in church, in his community, and in his neighborhood. 
this love also made him an awesome Jabek or grandfather. And the smile he had when he saw his grandkids could really, truly light up the world. We still feel his spirit with us because that kind of love never dies. But in all honesty, we miss him terribly. And that's an understatement. This kind of grief normally is difficult, but COVID grief, it's a whole nother level kind of, it's a whole nother level of grief. We weren't able to have a wake, a proper funeral, or even a burial where we could gather, embrace, and pray together instead of only just waving at the cemetery gates. It's beyond heartbreaking. Our process of grieving, our chance to say goodbye one last time was stolen. We will never forget that his life mattered, that his sacrifices will be cherished and honored through his children and grandchildren. And my father, like so many throughout our city, our country and our world, is not just a number. He mattered. His life mattered. So I encourage you in the honor of the late Stanley Miklas, a man who loved his family, his church, his country and community to live Semper Fi. Thank you. Thank you, Stefania. Next up is my friend, Kevin Moore, who is a COVID survivor and a frontline healthcare worker. I gotta take my mask down because I, I can't read otherwise. Um, I thought it was overrated. I thought they're blowing it out of proportion. I thought it sounded like a bad flu. I was wrong, really, really wrong. On March 11th and 12th, my husband told me that we would have to cancel our planned vacation to Florida because it looked like the hotel business he works in was gonna shut down for a bit and that the virus was gonna be really bad. I balked. We're going to Florida, I need this vacation. My husband's insight and wisdom was correct. We canceled our trip that we were gonna take on March 13th. By Sunday, March 15th, everything had shut down pretty much around Jersey City and Manhattan, and I was feeling a little weird, but I chalked it up to nerves. March 16th, I started to feel pretty lousy, tired, brain foggy, and my chest was feeling tight. March 17th, I was in it. I had almost every symptom, extreme fatigue, dry hacking cough, earth shattering headache, shortness of breath, muscle aches, loss of taste and smell, chest tightness. I was able to get a test on March 19th, but it was like asking for a gold bar. And the results came back that night, positive. Oh my God, I had it. I knew I would get it, but now, right in the beginning, fear ran through my body and I began to weep. I'm healthy, but who knows? The first week was bad enough, but the second week was terrible. Day eight through 12 were nothing short of frightening. The chest tightness felt like a belt around my body that would tighten and then release. It felt like there was a spider living in my heart and that it would move its legs into my lungs and I could feel my bronchial tubes. My shortness of breath was happening without any movement or exertion. I was sitting on the couch just trying to catch my breath and get it under control. I'm a nurse, I should go to the hospital, but I didn't. I was too scared. If I could just catch my breath, I'd be okay, I thought. There were episodes during those days that I started to realize that this was much more serious and I was at a breaking point. The shortness of breath was not allowing my body to get all the oxygen it needed and I began to hallucinate hearing my mother's voice. It was wonderful to hear her, but she died 10 years ago. I knew it wasn't real, but for a moment or two, it kind of felt nice to hear her. I told my doctor who insisted I go to the ER and I begged him for a nebulizer to see if I could get my airway to open up a bit. He was very reluctant, but he gave me 24 hours to get better or I was gonna have to head in, so I agreed. Fortunately, it worked. But my sickness continued and lasted a full three weeks with other symptoms like this weird feeling of hot, hot skin that felt like it was a thousand degrees. All the while, my temperature was 97.6. I have issues with long haulers, but it's getting better. I still have exercise-induced shortness of breath, but much less than I used to. I had no lung issues prior to COVID. 
The fatigue is better, but for me, the biggest impact is on my brain function. Weird loss of verbiage, which is why I have to read. <laughs> Unable to push through a thought, insomnia, and anxiety that makes me break out in sweats that I never had before. When you hear 400,000 people have died and more than 24 million people have been infected, those numbers seem insane. You think, I'm okay, I'll be okay. It's like the flu. If I get sick, I can handle it. It's only a small percentage of people who really get sick or die. You see, each one of those 400,000 Americans, like tonight, had a story, a family. Each one of them could not get to be with their loved ones when they passed away. They were at the mercy of nurses and doctors that could hold their phone to their ear so that they could connect with them. I hear the virus fatigue in people's social media posts and in video conferencing. We know that social distancing and mask wearing is working. I wish we would have known that in February, what a difference that would have made. We're so lucky to have the vaccine, so blessed at the speed to which it was developed and studied. Its safety and efficacy cannot be understated. We must encourage everyone we know to get it, and we must be sure to put our most vulnerable in the front of the line. Truth, it's going to be with us for a while. Truth, mild COVID-19 means mild pneumonia. Truth, the virus loves that you're tired of it. It wants you to break all the protocols and go back to normal. That's how it can spread. I went back to work with a new perspective in April and couldn't believe what I was witnessing. I've changed the name and genders of these patients to protect their privacy, but I wanted to share briefly their story because it's mine. Mike was a teacher, four years younger than me, spent a week being steps away from not being able to breathe for himself. He contracted the virus and tested positive the same day as me. He was on every kind of oxygen support one could have before event. And he said, Kevin, I'm really scared. Can you stay in here with me for a little bit? I was covered in PPE, but I felt like I had to have some immunity from this, so I stayed in the room. And he told me, through his gasping breath, how much he loved being a teacher. A couple days later, I transported him to the ICU to be intubated. Again, he turned to me and said, Kevin, would you stay in here with me for a little bit? I'm scared. Am I gonna die? I told him, I'll be right here. Hold my hand, I got you. We're gonna help you fight this, okay? Kindness dissipates fear. Another patient was a nurse. I could see her numbers tank and went into the room and it's the fear, it's palpable. She said, I'm having trouble. I can't catch my breath. Sorry. It's hard to talk about. She was fit as a fiddle and told me three weeks before this she was training for the marathon in the fall. I stood next to her and had her close her eyes and together we visualized herself running the marathon next year. Thinking about the sun in her face and her breath powerfully moving her through space, kindness dissipates fear. Breathe, breathing. You have no idea what it's like not to be able to catch your breath when all you're doing is lying down. You forget what a normal inhale and exhale feels like. The last patient was a 50-year-old who was fighting late-stage cancer that had metastasized through her body. I was in the room for hours with her, holding the phone and letting her children and spouse talk to her. She didn't have the energy for more than a word or two, but her family's love was bringing her comfort. I held her hand and she squeezed it. She said to me after that call, I'm so tired, no more fighting, no more holding. I told her, it's okay, your family will be okay. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. It's okay to be scared. I'll stay with you as long as you like. I was in the room for a bit and she fell asleep. About an hour later, we called her family and had them say their final words. As she passed away quietly, me, her, and her family on the phone. Each of those patients did not survive. That is three of the 400,000 Americans who died. Many nurses have stories exactly like this. Two, too many stories. The common theme is to be grateful for your breath. Each inhale and exhale. I'm so lucky to have had these connections with patients 
and to let them know for a brief period that I knew what it was like. I was just as scared. So you think it's okay, I can handle that sickness. However, you aren't thinking of the people you love who might be much more susceptible to the virus. You can give it without ever knowing you have it. Many people right now at this moment are worried about their life. They're, worried about, they're not worried about waves. They're not worried about herd immunity. They're not worried about vaccination. They're worried if they're gonna survive. Wash your hands, wear a mask, socially distance, and be grateful for every breath you take. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, we have Councilman James Solomon. Good evening. I just want to echo. The thanks to uh, Sabila and all the organizers here tonight. Um, it's in part because of, of what you guys said, we haven't had a chance to all, all come together and, and grieve and be with each other. And uh, hearing your words is, is deeply, deeply touching. Uh, I want to thank you know everyone in Jersey City, um, the mayor, the uh, doctors and nurses at our hospitals, all our essential frontline workers who have worked extraordinarily hard to get us through this uh, time and to get us through the next couple of months. And to thank President-elect Biden and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris for organizing a national remembrance, which, which was desperately needed. Uh, and, and last, I just want to say that, that the, these words just uh, remind us that, that there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we are still in the middle of this fight. And uh, as, as uh, was said, there is COVID fatigue for, from folks, but it's nothing compared to uh, having it and being in it. So hopefully tonight serves as a reminder for all of us uh, to double down on everything that we've done, uh, all the, the little to big sacrifices we've made that, to keep our neighbors and our families safe. So wearing masks, washing hands, staying socially distant, avoiding indoor gatherings where we're unmasked, just continue to do it each day uh, until we are through this. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilman. And we have uh, Councilman Rolando Navarro, Lavarro, sorry, coming up now. Uh, thank you, Sabila. Um, and um, Sabila, thank you for organizing this and to all of the folks who organized cultural affairs, Christine, the whole team. Uh, Sabila, uh, I, when you spoke, I was reminded of your father. At, uh, um, and, and I do remember now that uh, he had me at uh, a restaurant and there was an award ceremony and he was very, um, very warm and welcoming to me and, and he was giving out awards to a lot of community le leaders and other folks like that. So I, I want to just offer my condolences and um, my, my thoughts and prayers to you and your entire family on that. Um, Kevin, uh, thank you for your, for your words uh, and thank you for being a healthcare hero. Um, along with so many others, and uh, your your <laughs> your words have conjured up uh, a lot of memories for me. Um, all of you, and uh, um, I too am a COVID survivor from uh, uh, mid March, and uh, and uh, all those healthcare heroes. I just want to say thank you. God bless you. Thanks. I remember the days when I was in the hospital, and I just thought so scared. Thought I wouldn't make it. Didn't know what was coming. And I, my wife is here with us tonight, and I'm reminded of that. Brought me back there, and just how 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 terrifying that was. I can just imagine for every family. And I'm so sorry to everybody who has lost lost loved ones so unnecessarily um, in this country. Over 400,000 and counting. And I don't want to take up a whole lot of time. I just wanted to invoke a couple of names tonight. To, Vernon's councilman, uh, Michael Yun, my friend and colleague as well. Um, which the one thing you should know about him that I remember from his eulogy is from his son, is that literally when he was in the hospital, his son said that he wanted his budget book. 
uh, while he was in the hospital for COVID because he wanted to work on his budget, the city budget. And that's the kind of man he was, constantly working and constantly fighting for the people of Jersey City. Uh, my former colleague, Councilwoman Viola Richardson, who was a fighter for uh, underrepresented communities and fighting for social justice. And, um, and she was my friend and, and she was a fierce, fierce advocate. Uh, and then more recently, the, the community lost uh, Roger Ejazi. Uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, thank you all and, and God bless you all. And thank you again for organizing this, Sabila. Uh, and next up is Council, Councilwoman uh, Mira Prinzeri. So thank you, Sibelia, and to everyone who was involved in organizing this event this evening. Um, the stories of your loved ones are very powerful, and sharing those stories, I'm hoping, is a way for you all to start to really, truly grieve and heal, because death is hard no matter what the circumstance and situation. Um, when our council colleague, when we got the news that he passed away, I was with Council President Waterman and Councilwoman Ridley, and not only was there shock and disbelief, but we looked at each other and she said, we can't even hug each other right now. And so some of our normal ways of helping each other through this, we just aren't really supposed to do for the safety of ourselves and our family. So again, I hope that this gives you some peace and comfort. And to the health coworkers, all of our frontliners, thank you guys for doing doing um, the work of angels. We appreciate you. And hopefully the numbers will not continue to climb the way that they're talking, that they will. So please just wear your masks, be socially distanced, make sure that you're taking the necessary precautions to take care of yourselves and your family. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council President Joyce Waterman. Good evening. You know, as I was sitting back listening to um, the words from those who have been affected by this, and I know I've been affected by this. We, I lost a girlfriend and then my son had it. This is an ugly, ugly, ugly disease. But the only way you can conquer this is as we all come together and define the odds. You know, this pandemic thinks that it will lick us. But because of events like this, it reminds us how we as Americans, when we stick together, we can heal one another. You know, in the 60s, Diana Ross made this song, song says, reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place. And tonight, you're making this world a better place. You know, I applaud you for your strength because um, I know what it is to lose someone and you have to go past how you feel in order to reach someone else. So tonight, we're going past how we feel as people and reaching out to others to let them know they're not in this alone. As being a pastor and people were calling me and asking me, how do I deal with grief? I, I can't touch, you know, I can't see them. You know, I said, don't let this day define you. There will be another day and we can all get together and we can close the book and we can all grieve. Just because this happened on March the 8th or March the 12th in your lives, remember there's another day coming where we can close the book and allow us to grieve with one another. And I said, that day is coming. At this time, let's remember their lives and celebrate them because it's because of them that you are who you are. So I say, may God bless you. Let's continue to look forward. Tomorrow we believe it'll be a brighter day and that's what we have in this country. We have hope, and it's the hope that gives us the strength. God bless you, and keep reaching out and touching someone's hand. Uh, Councilman Robinson is gonna be up next. Yay! Yay! Good evening, everyone. I just wanna briefly say thank you to the organizers, thank you to Cultural Affairs, and thank you to all of the heroes that we live amongst every single day. I mean, without the heroes, the, the frontline workers, this would be something even worse than what it is. COVID-19 has touched everyone's life. And 
because of that, we just want to be mindful and celebrate the days that we do have here on earth. And we want to just make sure that we love our loved ones like it's the last day that we'll ever see them because we don't know what day or what time our number will be called. But we just want to say thank you again for everyone in the city, all of the frontline workers, all of the organizers, and we want to just really honestly say thank you to the new administration coming in to set this in, in motion, to give us an opportunity to serve. And, and I want to say thank you again and, and, and bless you because of all the work you did. And I understand Kevin, he, he talked about the stories from the, the, from the other side, something that we probably would never see. And there's so many stories like that but they are not statistics they are real people with families that they left and we want to say thank you again to all of the frontline workers for all that you do and everything that you have uh done for this country so thank you and everybody stay blessed thank you so much uh our final speaker of the nice night will be our wonderful artist christina libby who will tell you more about her Floral Hearts program. Hi, it's cold, so I will be very quick. Um, I started the Floral Heart Project in the spring um, when... <laughs> uh, I started the project when I realized that there wasn't any sort of the visual representations of what we normally associate with mass trauma events. We didn't see flowers everywhere. We didn't see photos everywhere. Um, and I found that heartbreaking. Um, I have found it more heartbreaking as we have looked to uh, people, families, COVID loss families to set up their own vigils and their own tributes and petition for their own memorials. Um, and so I started this project as a way to represent the people we have lost. Um, I'm deeply, deeply thankful to 1-800-Flowers who has partnered with me to do this in multiple locations around New York and to do it in many um, locations now around America. We are looking for more people in more cities to volunteer. So um, if you want to bring a floral heart to your community, uh, just go to the website floralheartproject.com and, um, and you can sort of reach out and, and we can teach you how to do it. But I think the big message that I have for people is that we don't want to let people who've lost someone mourn alone. Um, and that every one of us can do something to help recognize the grief and the loss. Like coming here today and listening to the stories, um, send flowers, send cards, tell people that you care about them. It makes a huge, huge difference when you're suffering from grief. And big thanks for putting this on and, and sharing your story, which I know is really very difficult. Almost done, I promise. I'm going to read again. Um, but thank you so much again for joining us tonight, each and every one of you who's come out here, everyone who's watching the live streams. Uh, thank you again to all the, administ uh, all the officials who made this event a reality. I can't tell you how much this means to me, my family, and the COVID loss community, not only in Jersey City, but around the world. In pausing to recognize our loved ones, their lives and their contributions, you are validating the trauma and loss of the COVID bereaved community. Acknowledgement like this reassures us that we aren't just fending for ourselves like we were for most of last year. It reminds us that we have allies in this ongoing struggle. Thanks again to everyone for coming here. I have two asks, two asks of you. Please don't grow numb to the numbers. The next time you see that total tally of COVID deaths and you've been lucky enough to have not been personally touched by it, think of our fathers. Think of Shafkat, Robert, John, Stanley. Remember them and the lives they lived and the cruelty of their painful and lonely deaths. That way we can extend this beautiful moment of remembrance into our daily lives. And maybe then we can all start taking this virus seriously. Maybe then we can change COVID from being just a political talking point, fodder for COVID deniers, or something that's happened to someone else. 
and really make it into the enemy we have together, that we can combat together as a nation. All of you, please keep social distancing. And if you or someone you know has lost a loved one to COVID, please direct them to COVID-19 loss support for family and friends. COVID loss is difficult and it's isolating, but I want everyone out there who's going through it to know that they are not alone, that this community exists and we are in it together. Thank you so, so, so much and please stay safe.